I think that adults should be allowed to be adults and to make different choices for themselves. Um, but actually, you know, an effective tool to allow people to uh, quit smoking, the best way to do that is the harm reduction model. Hello world, welcome to the Vaping Unplugged podcast. Everything you need to know about vaping and tobacco harm reduction. Hello world, hello vapers, and welcome to uh, Vaping Unplugged, uh, World Vapers Alliance's podcast on all things regarded vaping and tobacco harm reduction. And today uh, our guest is Rim Ibrahim from the Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, the communications uh, officer and a very big passionate uh, vapor. Um, so welcome, welcome Reem. Today uh, we are going to talk about all things uh, about vaping in the UK, and it's really nice to have you here. We are uh, going to be a big, a really nice communications team, girls, <laughs> today in the podcast uh, talking about vaping in the UK. So thank you so much for taking your time today uh, to speak with me, and it's nice to meet you finally. Amazing! Thank you so much, Julia, for having me on. Uh, lovely. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, we can get started uh, with probably a bit of like general question is uh, how would you assess the situation around vaping in the UK right now? Um, it's a little bit, you know, sometimes uh, we celebrate UK for its approach and then the other days we sort of call on preserving Britain's approach to harm reduction. Uh, so, um, yeah, how, how would you comment on that? Yeah, it's really interesting. So, I mean, we'd always sort of talk about the UK and the UK government's approach to vaping as a pretty positive one. It's always sort of embraced um, the fact that vaping is a, a an effective tool to quit smoking. We saw even with, you know, the particularly restrictive uh, recommendations that the government have received. So, for example, with the Khan review that was published in uh, 2022, in the summer of 2022, even that report, which argued for various different restrictions and, of course, argued for famously the uh, generational tobacco ban, where um, the legal age of tobacco increases one year every year, even with all of those restrictions, it's still recommended that vaping is an effective tool to help smokers quit. So generally speaking... The UK has always sort of had a very positive approach to uh, tobacco harm reduction through vaping products. However, uh, as a result of, uh, I guess, various different political incentives that have resulted in the tobacco and vapes bill, we've, of course, seen um, most prominently in the media, the generational ban, which is going to be implemented if that uh, bill does pass in its current form. And, of course, um, various different restrictions on vapes, including flavours. And I think so what's interesting is there seems to have been a wider shift on the, on the on the part of the UK government around the use of vapes and especially around these two key aspects children and the environment it does feel as though every time uh, the government want to ban anything or restrict anything or any of our lifestyle choices it's uh, as a result of those two things the environment and children <laughs> yeah that's um that's very interesting that you mentioned the environment because I was looking through the paper that you published with Chris Snowden um, on the disposable vapes. And actually, you advocate for just like being more conscious with uh, recycling of the products. Um, so could you like give some more some of the arguments why uh, environmental concerns are not really such big concerns when it comes to disposable vapes, for example? Yeah, so this was a paper that was published by the Institute of Economic Affairs at uh, the end of last year, and it was co-written uh, co by my colleague Christopher Snowden and I. It's called A Vapid Solution, if you're interested and uh, want to read it. It's all, it's all available on the IA's website. Um, effectively, you know, there was a lot of media spin and a lot of media, um, I suppose, hype around a potential ban on disposable vapes, which is looking to be the case in the tobacco and vapes bill. And yeah, as I said earlier, you know, the environment and young people tend to be the two key reasons why, or the two, the two key arguments around why uh, the government seemed to be pushing ahead with this bound disposable vapes. So with this paper, we effectively looked at those key aspects and said, OK, is are these things really a problem? And if, it, if the environmental impact is true? So 
what's interesting about the environmental impact of disposable vapes is that they are minuscule in comparison to so we're looking at the lithium in those batteries they are minuscule in comparison to um the lithium production uh, required for for example electric cars electric vehicles which i believe there are upwards of you know 16 million uh, on our roads at the moment so if we're going to be talking about the environmental impact of disposable vapes and if, if that is truly the reason why we want to be banning or restricting these products, then we've got to be looking at various other different products that also require huge amounts of lithium production. The, the, the second aspect of that is allowing, or at least encouraging adults to be more responsible when it comes to uh, littering. I mean, anytime you've walked in the streets of London, you'll you'll see uh, lots of different colourful disposable vapes around the floor, and that, that's not acceptable. And I think we have to be open and honest about the fact that many, many consumers aren't being responsible with their vaping products. So one of the things that we spoke about in the paper is a potential deposit return scheme. Effectively, what that means is that uh, you can you have a sort of an industry-wide deposit return scheme where um, every, every single person has to pay a certain amount in order to uh, receive those disposable vapes. And then when you return it back, and so that then they're able to be uh, recycled, when you return it, then you receive that money back. And it's effectively using financial incentives to ensure that uh, consumers behave more, um, more responsibly with those products. But the, the, the point is that we don't need to be banning the products and taking away a safer choice from millions of adults, what we need to be doing is having a conversation about how we can mitigate those various different, um, different negative consequences of them. Yes, precisely. Uh, I think that honestly, disposable vapes uh, are such a great tool uh, to help people stay away from cigarettes. For example, if you're going if you're going out with your friends and uh, you used to smoke in the past and it happened with so many friends of mine, we would go out to have drinks um, and they, in the past, they would go and buy a pack of cigarettes. Now, yeah. all of them would go and buy a disposable vape because uh, they want to have something, you know, in their hand. They want to some, somehow release whatever, like, uh, in, encourages them to enjoy the night. Uh, and then... If you, if we had those responsible return schemes of vapes, or um, like the same thing happens if you are at the Christmas market and you buy, uh, I don't know, let's say some milled wine and you have to return the cup, uh, same thing could be implemented. But we don't really have to ban everything, right? Um, I think also for the companies, if they had some tax relief, if they had collected a certain amount of vapes back and then recycled them. Uh, that could also be an option, right? Yeah, I guess, yeah. The point is that like there are many different ways that we can mitigate those uh, negative consequences that we see as a result of people just not behaving responsibly. We can use financial incentives to encourage consumers to recycle. Especially, I mean, look, I mean that I would prefer that over a, over a ban on disposable vapes any day. But I mean, like you're totally right. Many many of us on a night out will buy a pack of cigarettes, um, and actually the disposable vapes are quick and they're easy. A lot of a lot of people sort of talk about this and say, okay, fine, I accept that vaping is safer and healthier than smoking. But, you know, I think, you know, why don't you just use a refillable liquid vape? Why, don't, why do you have to go and use a disposable vape? And I think that we need to have a conversation about many reasons, many reasons why consumers will choose disposable vapes over regular refillable vapes. A, they're pre-filled, they're pre-charged. You don't need to worry about charging it or refilling it or the liquid running out in the middle of you using it. It's already done and it's, it's already there for you. So the first reason is that disposable vapes are so much more convenient. Secondly, the cost. If you're, you know, in, in the wider scheme of things, if you're going to be vaping and you're, you're going to be completely switching from smoking to vaping, yeah, it's probably cheaper to buy a refillable vape. But if you're a smoker, and you're not really sure about whether or not you want to completely switch to vaping altogether. It's quite an investment to to invest in a you know forty pounds, fifty pounds, sometimes even more expensive uh, refillable uh, e cigarette. Actually, a lot of the time it's much easier to buy a disposable vape, which can run you about five or six pounds. That initial cost is much lower, and ultimately, even from a public health perspective, we want to be encouraging adult smokers to switch to vaping. 
thing. And what this does is effectively means that there is a lower price point for many of those adults. And actually, then uh, if you're an adult smoker, you're much more likely to make the jump to buy a five pound or six pound uh, disposable vape than you are to buy a 40 or 50 pound refillable vape, even though in the long term, it is more it is more expensive to do that. So, you know, there are two reasons, convenience and also uh, the price point, that initial price point, I think, is really important. Third reason, it's just the ease of having so many different flavors to choose from. And I really like, I've got um, the World Vapors Alliance adults like flavors too, um, uh, 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 jumper, which I always love to support. I, I also like to wear that at the airport because I feel like people can always uh, look at it. Um, but that's, that's always an important reason, right? Adults like flavors and many adult smokers that do switch to vaping actually say that using different flavors and there, there have been various studies that have that have shown this that actually if adults have help choosing different vaping flavors they are much more likely to stick with vapes and go then return back to cigarettes and so i think it's really important that we make the make these arguments there are many reasons why consumers will want to choose disposable vapes over over refillable e-cigarettes and actually we should be encouraging adults for even from a public health perspective we should be encouraging adults to switch to vaping if they've been lifelong smokers Yes, precisely. But also, you know, there is a knowledge gap. For example, um, when I was like, I remember maybe like five years, ago, five, six years ago, I only discovered vaping, uh, but I used to be smoking back then. And so uh, I was in New York with some of my friends and we were walking past the vape shop and I saw all of these huge, you know, devices, but I didn't even know how to operate it or uh, how it's going to work. And I think back then we didn't really have disposable vapes. So I actually didn't buy one because I was like, oh, what am I going to do with this? It's, it's complicated. Like, yeah. How, yes, how am I going to find this liquid? And it was like back in the day, only men were really vaping it. And uh, I was not fully sure, but it caught my attention already. Uh, however, there, I didn't really, like none of my friends were vaping and uh, I didn't know how to operate all of this. And so I think that also for many people, this kind of remains mystery how the devices might work if you're not really actively searching for that information, you know. So, and if you, if you don't really have people around you, like we've been listening to so many stories of uh, vapors who told, who told us how they came to switch from cigarettes. And it, it's usually somebody who brings them the device and shows them how to do it and tells them try. Uh, it's very rarely that, like, some of them do go and search for it uh, themselves, but a lot of times it's somebody else who introduces them to vaping and to vaping devices, which I think is also really crucial is to have that education on uh, how to use it. I we have been celebrating UK's uh, swap to stop campaign uh, where UK wanted to give out 1 million vapes to people to encourage them to switch from uh, cigarettes to vaping. Um, I think that's a really great initiative, uh, which yet go, goes against the generational ban. So could you talk a little bit about that and how uh, would that work together if that, if that would? Yeah, so there there were sort of conversations about the government introducing, um, sort of allowing um, adults who do smoke already to have that on prescription, and effectively mean that they're they're encouraged to switch to vaping. And again, this was sort of part of the government's previous, um, pretty positive, I would say, pretty positive approach to vaping. Especially when you look at you know international examples, you've got countries like Australia that have completely banned vaping, and so. I've always sort of said that the UK has had a pretty positive approach to vaping. And then we had this announcement, I believe it was um, mid last year, but I, I, I might be wrong, um, where the government have said that actually from a public health perspective, we what we can do what we can do is on the NHS, allow adults to have the option to switch to vaping. Now, the benefit of a policy like that is effectively what you're doing is you're saying to adults, okay, we're not going to be taking away uh, your right to choose or your, your freedom to choose um, what kind of products you use. But we are going to give you some knowledge around um, various different harm reduction products. And vaping, of course, as we know, is, is the most effective. It's been proven the most effective tool to help adults quit smoking. So effectively, what that is, is allowing adults on the NHS to switch to vaping. And it means that they can try it out. It means that they don't have the, um, the immediate cost of it they're not there's no cost to them it's, it's all done through the government itself 
Now, the reason why I think that this is interesting, and I think that it's a policy that could potentially work, but when we've got it alongside the generational tobacco ban, where we are effectively saying to adults, um, you know, you, you, you're not allowed to smoke and that this is, go that this is not going to happen, we're going to be treating the adults of the future, people that have born after 2009, like they're going to be children forever and like they can't make those choices. And that's actually why I know that in the vaping community, this is pretty divided everybody's pretty divided on this but i i'm completely against the generational tobacco ban i think that adults should be allowed to be adults and to make different choices for themselves um but actually you know well, an effective tool to allow people to uh, quit smoking the best way to do that is the harm reduction model i mean the international examples are there you've got a country like sweden where they use uh, lots of nicotine pouches or snus which i'm i also am a big snus user or nicotine pouch user <laughs> Um, but, you know, Sweden are a con is a country that has a smoking rate of less than 5%. So they've effectively achieved a smoke-free country, and they've not done that by banning tobacco products. They've not done that by restricting the age and increasing the age limit of adults that are allowed to buy those tobacco products. But they've achieved effectively a smoke-free country by allowing adults to choose safer products. And I think that we need to be looking at evidence-based policy, look at the evidence across the world. We don't need to be restricting adults' right to choose uh, their lifestyle choices, but actually what we need to be doing is encouraging an education around these safer, healthier products. And I think that's why we need to be talking about nicotine harm reduction rather than blanket bans on, on, on lifestyle choices. Yes, precisely. And I, I was really impressed. I was reading on the uh, UK government's website about the proposal for the generation, generational ban. And they're saying, you know, we want to create the first smoke-free generation in the world. Like they use the word create, not, you know, achieve by natural way of encourage, like natural way of being, because that's exactly what happened in Sweden. Snooze has been a, a I don't know, more than 100 year old tradition uh, in the country. It's something that's natural to their culture. It's natural to their way of uh, being. It came from workers just chewing the tobacco leaves, if I'm not mistaken. But UK wants to uh, artificially create uh, the smoke free generation, which honestly makes me think about, you know, what would be the other precedents that that can become a precedent for something else like oh all right let's then uh, implement uh, the no coca-cola country or you know like uh, mm -hmm. we can then prohibit well, we this we can it. prohibit that I yeah. mean, it, what this really is, and I think it's important to, um, you know, argue against these kind of restrictions on lifestyle choices altogether, because ultimately they've they're gonna they've come for smoking now. They are gonna come for other lifestyle choices yes. like vaping in the future, and it is a slippery slope. And I know that people say, "Oh, this is a straw man's argument. Nobody, no, this isn't actually going to happen." Look at the, I mean, look at the history of of tobacco policy in this country, in the UK. We had a ban on uh, smoking indoors. Then we had a ban on smoking in cars. Then we had a ban uh, with children. Then we had a ban on... Um, on uh, colourful packaging, we had pl the plain packaging uh, regulations, and then you know, again, it was taking away little by little every single little choice that, we're, that adults are allowed to make when it comes to uh, nicotine products. And then they, now they're coming for vaping flavours, and I think that it's really important. And of course, um, smoking altogether—it's effectively a prohibition, the generational ban. So again, I think it's really important that we make the arguments for freedom and freedom to choose, as well as the public health arguments. But the restricting flavor, uh, vaping flavors has absolutely no basis in fact, absolutely no basis in health in, in, in public health fact. If you want adults to make safer choices and you want adults to quit smoking, you've got to allow them to choose safer and healthier products. By restricting safer and healthier products, you are actively, the government are actively encouraging, effectively encouraging adults to remain smokers because they're making it more difficult for them to make the switch. So yeah. I think it's really important that we look at this in the wider context of lifestyle, um, lifestyle economics and government the government's wider uh, uh, sort of policy around these different products. 
Precisely. And then, you know, uh, there was an attempt to create a generational ban uh, in Bhutan, which led to a lot of illicit trade. And then uh, last year, Malaysia was proposing the generational endgame as well, uh, which I think at the end of the year, they uh, removed this clause from the legislation because um, the attorney general made the claim that it's unconstitutional because it can create uh, the double law, basically the double law standard, for some people uh, who are beyond uh, the threshold and for people who are under the threshold. And that's the exact same that's going to happen in the UK. I'm, I'm really wondering uh, if that were to, like, if that bill is going to pass, which I hope not, but how are they going to manage the uh, kind of the legal part of this? Because there isn't really an effective precedent. And then all of those people who won't be able to buy vapes uh, or sorry to buy uh, flavored uh, flavored vaping uh, products who won't be able to buy cigarettes what are they going to do they're gonna uh, probably go to the black market they're going to uh, import it from someplace else where these products are available because uh, it's still possible so uh, I think that people it's not just that we are all, we are want all the freedom in the world. We want to have some basic freedoms. It's about to make choices about our own bodies and about our own lives. So it's really uh, interesting how uh, step by step all these freedoms are being sort of taken away from us. Mm, absolutely. It's the encroachment of the nanny state. That's that's what's happening. Um, I think it's really interesting. You bring up the, the legal arguments. Um, there is an argument that there could be some legal challenges with this bill because effectively, I mean, age discrimination is illegal in this country and in many countries. And when you, this, this generational ban would effectively create two classes of citizens, those adults that have the right to buy tobacco products and, and, and equally adults that don't have the right to buy tobacco products. I mean, in 10 years time, we would be in a position where a 25 year old would be legally allowed to buy tobacco products and a 24 year old would not. So there is this scope here for potentially some age discrimination law to, to take into effect. And there might be uh, some conversations around that. So I suspect this isn't the last we're going to hear about these arguments. And I suspect we'll be talking about it for a while as, as it goes through, through, the, through Parliament. Yeah, uh, well, speaking on nanny state, um, I, uh, I was checking your last year's nanny state index. However, uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't think you've released it yet for 2024. Um, but I yeah, saw we, that we last year. Yeah, we release every two years. Oh, all right. So, and I saw that last year, uh, UK wasn't really in the list of green countries. Yes. So this is what's interesting. The UK um, is, you, is actually one of the best places to, for, to vape at the moment. But we will probably see the impact of that, of, of these various different restrictions on flavours actually mean that the UK go down on the um, on the Freedom Index for the Nanny State Index. But the UK is the worst country in Europe to smoke because of the various different tobacco duties and the various different restrictions on smoking. The UK is the worst country in Europe in terms of regulation to smoke, but it is pretty good for vaping at the moment. What we will probably see, as I said, is the is the UK actually moving down on that on that scale for freedom because of the tobacco and vapes bill. And actually, the UK have the, the tobacco and vapes bill have effectively. Uh, meant that the nanny state index will probably mean that the UK will be kicked down down the road. I believe we were seventh in the nanny state index last year. Uh, so I think the UK will probably be moving down uh, further down as a result of the tobacco and vapes bill. Well, I guess it brings us only to one conclusion, you know, that uh, we really, really, really need uh, our politicians to to listen to the consumers and to actually hear you know what the public wants and what the public is saying i was also uh, very positively impressed to hear a lot of arguments uh, last week in the westminster there was a, a debate regarding cop 10 and i was really pleasantly uh, impressed to hear so many um spokespeople for harm reduction and for vaping and uh, being very proud of UK's achievements, you know, uh, with its progress to uh, to harm reduction, with availability of vapes, um, and that was that was really sort of a good step forward. I hope. 
I don't know, some voices for change. Yeah, no, it's really interesting, actually, especially with the tobacco and vapes bill, because I think I saw that debate um, clipped on the uh, World Vapors Alliance social media. It's, yes, we love it. Yeah, yeah, and it's really interesting because this there is no real political need for this kind of regulation. I mean, of course, um, there, are, there are many different sort of political incentives for many politicians to want to restrict various different aspects of our lifestyles. Um, but it seems as though this is a sort of vanity project by uh, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. And I don't like to get too deep into the uh, into the politics of it, but, you know, the Conservative Party itself has sort of undergone a, a couple of different changes over the last few years. Um, the party has sort of tended to, to lean towards standing for freedom, standing for lifestyle choices. And it doesn't seem as though at the moment the government are really making those arguments. They're not making the argument that adults should simply just be able to make those choices for themselves. If you're an adult, you should be free to choose, you know, what kind of aspects of your lifestyle you'd like to change and what you would not like to change. What's interesting is that many of those um, different policies, especially the ones in the tobacco and vapes bill, have been argued against by various different backbench MPs on both sides of the house, actually. Um, but I've spoken to a couple of different MPs about this particular issue, and many of them are saying, you know, I thought I thought we were the party for freedom. What's going on? Why, you know, why are we taking away these choices? Which is why. I think we need to, A, make the argument for freedom firstly. We need to say, hold on a minute, we can talk about the health aspects of this later. But first of all, adults should be free to make lifestyle choices. Then we can talk about the fact that actually this generational tobacco ban, the restrictions on vaping flavors will not do anything, will not, will not actually benefit public health. So take the tobacco, uh, the generational tobacco ban. You, you've mentioned this before, the, the huge illicit market that will open up. We saw it happen in South Africa. We saw what happened uh, in, in various different countries where actually tobacco products were severely regulated or even banned. What happened? Surprise, surprise, adults still smoked. They just received it. They were just were able to purchase those products illegally. So there is the cost to the treasury because they're not receiving all those taxes uh, from those um tobacco products, but also it's much more dangerous because adults are then uh, choosing or being able to buy products that are illegal and on the black market and are, of course, unregulated. Take the restrictions on vapes. If you are if you are restricting vaping flavors, you are not helping public health. You are actively making it more difficult to, for adult smokers to choose healthier, safer products like vaping. So I think we've got to first make the arguments for freedom. First, make the arguments that adults should be allowed to free should be free to choose uh, their lifestyle choices, and then we can start talking about the public health issue, which actually isn't even an argument in this instance. And I don't think that this will benefit uh, the the public uh, I don't think this will benefit public health at all yeah uh, precisely I, I really love how you're starting you know the conversation about freedom generally because it's uh, something that a lot of times is being missed and forgotten among all of the policies and legislations that we are working with um, yeah so uh, I think that the next thing that goes on our t-shirt is adults love freedom too I guess <laughs> Um, I would definitely be the first to wear that jumper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make this case. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that sort of our message to the UK is to actually keep being the champion of harm reduction and keep uh, protecting our right to choose less harmful product. And I think that one big thing that a lot of times is forgotten is that our goal is not to arrive to vaping per se. Our goal is to uh, quit smoking. Uh, vaping is the most efficient and successful tool there is so far. There is also nicotine pouches, there is snooze, um, there is uh, other, uh, so many different products that can help with this, but then the end goal is to, uh, I guess, quit whatsoever. If you cannot quit, uh, all right, let's keep using the less harmful products. If you've never been smoking, uh, please don't start neither smoking nor raping or using anything else. And I think that's kind of the most important message that a lot of times is being forgotten. A lot of policymakers think, oh, they just want to, you know, keep vaping. Uh, we want to keep vaping to don't be smoking. Uh, that's, yeah, that's the truth. So. 
I so I, I agree with that, and I do think that you know if you're if you're already not a nicotine nicotine product user, there is no need for you to take up vaping. But I'm going to make a bit of a controversial argument here. <laughs> so I actually think when we're looking at across societies, especially modern societies over the last, say, 100 to 200 years, there hasn't actually been a nicotine-free society. I would actually much prefer adults to be making safer choices, even if they've, say, say for example, you're a fresh 18-year-old and you decide, you know what, I'm out drinking with my friends or I'm, you know, in a group of people and I want to try a nicotine product. I would much prefer that that fresh 18-year-old or whoever old they are starts to take up a safer product like vaping or snus or nicotine pouches or heat not burn. I would much prefer that that adult take up a safer choice than smoking. So yes, if you don't already smoke or you don't already vape, there is no need to take it up. But if adults in the future are going to be taking up nicotine products, and so far we've not been able to achieve a nicotine-free society ever... If adults are going to be making those choices anyway, I would much prefer them take up uh, nicotine uh, nic- uh, products that are much safer than than smoking in the first instance. Yeah, precisely. I mean, my point is that we don't encourage anybody to start, you know, if they've never did. Mm-hmm. However, uh, we can't we really expect to, people. You might as well. Yeah, exactly. If you, if you are going to, you might as well uh, be well knowledge. You might as well be well educated yes. about the fact that there are safer products to smoking. Exactly. And I think the uh, the words that you said are really, really important, which is educated. Uh, it's really important that, you know, perhaps instead of banning, we move on to educating people about all the different products that are out there, which hopefully can uh, make our world you know, a little better off at the end of the day. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's, um, it's you know, we know that vaping isn't risk-free, but we do know from various different studies, I'm going to cite uh, Public Health England's 2015 review, that, which is obviously always cited, that vaping is at least more than 95% less harmful than smoking. There, is, there aren't those products of combustion. We're not setting tobacco on fire when we're vaping. We are using an aerosol, a vapor aerosol, to heat e-liquid that will, sorry, we're heating e-liquid to turn it into a vapor aerosol and deliver nicotine to the lungs in a much safer and healthier way it's not risk-free but it is more than 95 percent less harmful and so we need to be clear about the facts there and when we're making policy decisions when we're talking about the way in which we regulate those products and the way in which we're allowing adults to make various different choices we should be allowing adults to make safer and healthier choices and we shouldn't be implementing policies that restrict that Precisely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, thank you so much, Reem, for, for coming in. Do you want to, to give some final message to our audience? I'm going to link the Nanny State Index and your paper uh, and Epicenter and uh, IES websites uh, to this podcast. However, if you want to uh, give some final message. Amazing. Thank you so much, Julia. And yeah, I mean, look, I think that ultimately we've got to be making the arguments for freedom first and adults should be completely free to make those lifestyle choices and we shouldn't be restricting safer and healthier choices from adult smokers. Ultimately, if we're going to be restricting flavours and we're going to be implementing a generational tobacco ban where adults aren't going to be able to make their own lifestyle choices, what we are doing is we are taking away their freedom first, but we're also implementing policies that might not even benefit public health yes well thank you so much and uh i look forward to reading more papers of yours uh, more analysis on uh, england's approach to harm reduction and i really look forward to the day to see england being in the same line with sweden uh, among the so, small free countries by the natural course of letting people be free thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Oh, can I just can I just add something very, very quickly? Sorry. Yes, of course. 
obviously we've got the, this year uh, COP10, which was rescheduled, uh, is going to be cut, uh, is going to be, uh, I believe, in the next month or so. And so I think it's really important that we do talk to our politicians and we make it very clear that the UK government should be standing up for for the right to choose, but ultimately for the right to choose vaping. The World Health Organization have effectively argued for incredible amounts of restrictions, sometimes even bans on various flavors uh, and, and various different types of vaping products. They've, I, I believe that the, the World Health Organization have argued for a complete ban on disposable vapes. So we need to be making these arguments and ensuring that the UK government and the various different officials that will be representing the UK at COP10 do actually make those arguments for freedom to choose. Yes, and we actually we encourage um, we encourage our community to write to their MPs, to their MEPs. Um, we are launching now the campaign uh, Every Life Counts. Uh, it's going to be a petition to the members of the new European Parliament to call on them and to make that plea that please do not put uh, nicotine products together with tobacco products in the same clauses. Like let's differentiate and make this legislation evidence-based and risk-based. Um, it's going to, we are going to be spending a, a lot of time collecting signatures uh, and then submitting it once the next term starts uh, to MEPs. However, uh, WVA also has uh, action centers to write to uh, UK MPs. Uh, and if you are in somehow else contact with, with the MPs, please reach out to them. That's me talking to our audience. So uh, please do, do so, raise your voice, and let's make sure that uh, we can wave on. Amazing. Thank you so much, Julia, for having me on. I really enjoyed that conversation. Well, that's the wrap of our episode with Rim Ibrahim. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation. I loved it so much. And I hope that you found many new insights about uh, vaping in the UK, about the generations ban, generational ban, um, about the pro, uh, ban on, um, on vape flavors. Uh, and you've heard a lot of good cases why we need to keep reaching out to our policymakers and uh, demand for our freedom to choose uh, our nicotine products and our freedom to make our lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle choices. Uh, please follow WVA, visit www.worldvaporsalliance.com or follow us on social media and stay tuned for the next episode of Vaping Unplugged.